Hello guys, and welcome here to another edition of Out of Turn 4. I'm Brian here with the uh, new episode. Let's get started. Let's start out with the IndyCar news this week. Of course, the big news, Colton Herta has dominated the IndyCar race over at St. Pete. He led 97 of 100 laps. The only laps he didn't lead, he was on the pit lane. So a very, very dominating effort. The most laps led ever in the St. Petersburg Grand Prix event. And that's huge. Um, you know, big congratulations to Colton. Uh, we know just how talented Colton Herta is. And, you know, it may not show inconsistency yet. And, and it'll get there. It is year three for Colton Herta. You know, it'll show in in the coming years with any luck. But I don't think it should be any surprise how talented this driver is. Um... And he may be getting recognition for that. Michael Andretti has received multiple calls about Colton Herta's availability. Um, of course, not in the IndyCar paddock, but on the F1 side of things. F1 teams are looking at Colton Herta. And, and and Michael Andretti has said, although I would like to keep my driver in his in the stable, I'm not going to hold him back from pursuing F1. Now, we talked last week on the show about Pato Award getting a possible off-season test for, you know, F1. And I s said strongly, don't go over there. I'm going to say the same thing for Colton Herta. He's never going to make it in F1. I, I, I think he's a talented driver, but F1, I don't know. I'd, I'd just say, I, I shouldn't say he won't make it, but his odds are so far against him. So, at the end of the day, I, I guess I just don't want to see Colton go there. He should just stay in IndyCar. If you want to know about F1, ask Roman Grosjean how brutal F1 is. And I guarantee you, you'll want to stay. Actually, ask Sebastian Bourdais, too. Ask either of those two. Heck, Marcus Erickson, too. Trust me, I think you're better off in the States racing for Michael Andretti. Doesn't get much better than that. Um, another headline from the IndyCar race, of course. A.J. Foyt's driver, uh, Sebastian Bourdais, speaking of him, he got another top 10 finish. And he's looking pretty solid to open the season. Um, this does not come as a surprise to me. I said he would be a dark horse in the St. Petersburg race because this is a track he is just so good at. This was not a shocker. And Sebastian Borde, if anyone can get, if anybody can get A.J. Foyt back on its feet, it's Sebastian Borde. He is the guy. Okay, he is 100% the guy to do it. And who knows? I don't think it's going to be a winning season this year. I think it's going to be a big improvement season. And also, if anyone can help Dalton Kellett find his way through IndyCar, it's for sure Sebastian Bourdais. Again, um, I don't know if it'll be rewarded with a win. I sure hope so, but I don't know. Um, time will tell. Of course, A.J. Foyt has not won in a really long time in IndyCar, so for them to get back to victory lane I think is the end goal, but I think this season they can settle for some real growth, and some early growth is by far the most important thing here. And, you know, again, plenty of season left. I like their good start so far. I really like it for them. So with that as well, um, back to Herta though. Um, you know, again, he is for sure a title contender this year. I don't know why I did it backwards like that, so I apologize. I'm bouncing all over the place. But um, 
hey, Sebastian Bourdais, if things keep going very well over at A.J. Foyt, he could be a contender too. Uh, Alex Pillow, of course, left with the points lead over Will Power, who just received a nice little contract extension over at Team Penske. You know, I said it was either going to probably be him or Paginot out, and I guess thus far I'm wrong. Maybe Paginot is out. I can see that. You know, maybe he goes to Arrow McLaren Schmidt Peterson reunites with, uh, you know, that group. I, w I would like that. I think he was very successful with Sam Schmidt last time he was um, with that team in the 77. So I would like to see it. Will it happen? Who knows? Time will tell. And Schmidt Peterson's a much bigger team now than it was before. Um, of course, with the addition of McLaren, they have money to spend. They have a lot of money to spend on a team. Um, another article broke this week, too, on the IndyCar side. And it involves the scheduling situation. Of course, you may have seen my video over on Sports Collaboration Network when the IndyCar schedule was released. I stated my severe displeasure for the amount of road course races we saw on the NTT IndyCar schedule. I have been in the past with NASCAR, with IndyCar. I have been a big proponent. I have been a big promoter of having road courses on the schedule. I have been for sure a huge promoter of it. The one thing, though, the one thing that I have against this, okay, the one issue I have with this is there's such thing as too much. And I'm sorry, but the IndyCar was too much. It was way too much on the road course side of things. Um... IndyCar is now exploring adding more ovals. Excuse me. They're exploring adding more ovals to their schedule in 2022. Um, we know IndyCar does not want to run late into October, November because of football. And in some ways they're limited by doing so because NBC has the Notre Dame package and they have the Sunday night package. So it really limits what IndyCar can do, especially with NASCAR on the other networks. Um, so I created what I think would be an ideal schedule. So, of course, I'll just ramble off first what I consider to be untouchable, untouchable tracks. Um, and the first one, of course, a no-brainer. The Indianapolis Road Course, the Indianapolis Oval. Again, it's a straight profit for IndyCar. Um, IMS owns IndyCar. Roger Penske owns IndyCar and Indianapolis Motor Speedway. So at the end of the day, you're profiting, plain and simple. You know, you're not paying a track for track fees or anything for that matter. You're not paying NASCAR to use the track. Whatever the case may be, it's a straight profit running in Indianapolis. And not to mention the prestige of the track. Um, the oval, at least. The road course is relatively new. But the oval is 100% untouchable. You can't remove that from the schedule. I don't care if it's dangerous. I don't care what it is. And that track can never be removed from the schedule. It is cemented in my books. And everyone's books for that matter. Um, the next one up is Gateway. Hear me out here. Okay. Gateway the last two seasons. We've only had four or five ovals for the past few seasons. Gateway has had the best racing of those ovals. Um, 2019's race was by far the best thriller I have seen in a long time. 
Um, Gateway Under the Lights is a thriller. I'm telling you, NASCAR should consider adding Cup to Gateway. Um, you know, so that's why I say keep it on the schedule. And I'm sorry, it's Worldwide Technology Raceway Gateway. I'm sorry, I had, I had to say it that way not to offend our St. Louis listeners and viewers. Uh, Mid-Ohio is track number three. That's untouchable. It's a vintage track. I'm sorry. It's a vintage track. You can't remove it. Um, to me, it's one of the best road courses. Um, you know, it sells not just because I'm going there this summer, but because it's just it's a selling point. It's a vintage track. Road America is the last one on this list. And again, vintage track outside of Watkins Glen. And maybe my opinion is wrong, but outside of Watkins Glen, Road America is the next best road course available. So, that said, um, those are my four untouchables. Let's take a look at the schedule now that I wrote for IndyCar for 2022. And I hope if anyone from IMS is watching, please take this into consideration. Um, so, St. Pete opens the season. I left it opening the season. It's, it's the best track to open the campaign at the end of the day. It's the best track to open it. Um, one of the more thrilling, probably the most thrilling street course on the schedule. So, that's my reason for keeping it there. Barber Motorsports Park is race number two. Barber's just provided some good racing. You saw it last week. It provided some pretty decent racing. Alex Pelo got his first win, of course. But, you know, again, another market that I think they need to hit in the south. Um, then we go from Barber to Atlanta. Atlanta's getting a new configuration. This is my reasoning for it. Atlanta's getting a new configuration this off season. They're going to get a fresh pave. I think it's worth the shot. And the reason I say that is Texas, at the end of the day, it's a one-groove racetrack. This doubleheader next weekend is going to be a shit fest. There's no denying it. It will be a shit fest. Number four on the list is Long Beach. So, here's the thing. I have the schedule starting in April. Long Beach goes into May. Okay, Long Beach, again, you can have an IMSA doubleheader. Both small racing leagues, but it will benefit you at the end of the day to run there with both series because it'll be more money, um, more exposure. And, of course, again, you're hitting a huge market. And, again, street courses, I think, are a huge market. Um, after that, the Indianapolis 500. Now, you may be questioning me and saying, why isn't the GMR Indy Grand Prix before that? That's a huge part of May. You'll hear in a second why. Let's move forward here. I'm taking one of the Belle Isle races away. It's only going to be one race at Belle Isle. Okay, road courses should only get one date. Belle Isle, the reason it's still on the schedule, it's a selling point for one. Um, I believe 95,000 fans attended the race in 2019 when it was the double header. Um, Belle Isle's just got to stay. It's a, you know, Roger Penske's in charge. It's never getting removed. Not even if Michigan was on the table. Okay. So then the next one is mid-Ohio. Again, an untouchable track. Chances are that drags into mid-June, July. You know, that's why I put it there. And possibly late June, I could see that race being a selling point still. I don't know about 4th of July weekend, but it's one that would sell. 
Road America is race number eight on the schedule. And I'm going to highlight this as a possible NASCAR double header. Keep in mind, NASCAR does not have the truck series over at Road America. So you could easily run an Xfinity race there, an IndyCar race, and a Cup race all in the same weekend. Look into it. I mean, it, you know, it's a possibility. So I say leave that in July, possibly. Then, of course, next is the Nashville Street Circuit. Nashville is going to be on the schedule in the next few years. I, I don't have a critical judgment yet on the Nashville Street Course. So, at the end of the day, I have no thoughts on it yet, seeing that we have not seen a race there. And even still, I think you need to see at least two or three on that track before making a good judgment on it. My only concern is that bridge. Running across a bridge may be very dangerous. So, that's my only concern. Next up is Circuit of the Americas on the schedule. Um, let's face it, Coda is an open wheel track. We don't know yet if they're going to host F1. We know for sure they're going to host NASCAR next season in all likelihood. Um, you know, I think this track replaces Texas. In all honesty, Texas is not a track that should be hosting an IndyCar race. Um, this is probably the most unrealistic scenario that I see is Coda replacing Texas. But I think Coda is the better track. Um, and the reason I say this is unrealistic, Eddie Gossage has his hand so far up NASCAR and IndyCar's back end that it'll never happen. Eddie Gossage will talk his way out of it one way or another. He will talk them. He will sweet talk them until they come back. So that said, um, I say Coda number 10, don't get sold on it. Richmond is number 11. I think NASCAR should have allowed them to use Richmond this season, assuming they could get a corporate sponsor, which shouldn't be hard. Roger Penske's pretty good about that. I think that IndyCar should have had a chance there. Number 12, the Indianapolis Road Course. Okay, and here's where I put the NASCAR doubleheader. Okay, at the end of the day, there's no reason on a 17-race schedule, unless you're going to do a doubleheader, there's no reason that you should have two races at the same track. There's no reason IMS should have three races. I'm sorry, I will argue that over anyone any day of the week. Um, IMS should not have three races. It's not helping... It's counterproductive. I mean, yes, you're hitting... You're saying IndyCar is big in Indiana. It's big in Indianapolis. It needs to expand beyond Indianapolis to get any bigger. You're not going to appeal to fans in Indianapolis anymore than you already are. Okay? You got shops there. It'd be like NASCAR having three races at Charlotte or four races at Charlotte. What group are you targeting that you haven't targeted there already? If they haven't come, they're not going to. Okay? That said, make this the NASCAR double header. That's another reason why, because NASCAR will never go there in May. Um, if you're going to continue doing the NASCAR double at IMS, move the GMR Grand Prix to August. Okay? I would say move the NASCAR race to May, but NBC and Fox are going to have to work that out because Fox, I could tell you, has no interest in an IndyCar NASCAR doubleheader. And even if they do, it's going to hurt advertising because now it's on two different networks. Um, it's got to be on NBC. Let's put it that way. NBC and Fox would have to work out a deal to put it in May. And it would cost 
NBC, I think, a later race. And maybe, just maybe, something else down the road. I think it's going to be an IOU one if that's the case. Um, Pocono is race number 13. Hear me out here too. I know this one, actually, I said Coda was the long shot. This is the long shot. Pocono coming back on the schedule. But they need another mile and a half, or they need a track bigger than two miles that isn't Indianapolis in addition to it. Michigan is a possibility, I think. Pocono, I think, is a little bit of a greater possibility, but I think Robert Wickens, if he has any say with IMS and IndyCar, might not be happening. It's going to take a lot for IndyCar to want to go back there. And the other reason I said Pocono over Michigan, and this is a tough one for me because I wanted to put Michigan there, but... Pocono has a bigger market they can reach. They can reach the Philadelphia market. They can reach the New York City market. So two big two big and crucial markets can be reached by running at Pocono. And that's what they need for growth. And Pocono's attendance has grown quite a bit. But again, the safety part of it. But if you want to know my argument for the safety is, you got the halo, okay? You've got the arrow screen. It's a halo. But, um, yeah, you've got that. You've already got drivers who, you know, Ryan Hunter Ray probably would have died in that lap one crash. Okay? Ryan Hunter Ray could have died in that lap one crash at Barber had it not been for the arrow screen. It's already showing benefits. I say give it a year. I say give it maybe two years. See how it goes. And if after two years we're still seeing the same issues of career-ending injury. Um, no, career-ending injury. Uh, death. It was the other thing I was thinking of. Career-ending injury or death. Get out of there. Plain simple. Get out of there. Next up, I got Gateway. And I've got Gateway for a double header because let's face it, if any track on the schedule should have a double header, it should be Gateway. Not Texas. Texas, the double header there was the dumbest move IndyCar has ever made. One of the dumbest. If they were going to add ovals. Sorry, but... Um, Texas is not a good track. Gateway has proven to have good racing at night. Last year's race doesn't count in my books. You know, you could argue last year's races were dull. But it was in the daytime. It was in the middle of the heat. The night race there is where it's at. Better racing. Believe me on that. Put a race Friday, Saturday night. You will see better racing. Up next, I've got Homestead. Homestead, easily the best mile and a half in America right now. Easily the best one. Okay. So, I agree, go back there. And, of course, this one could be the most realistic. Because Road to Indy already tests there. IndyCar is going to do spring training there, I believe, next year. And I believe they have in the past. So why not reconcile here and put it back on the schedule? Not to mention very late in the schedule. Because now you've got a really good oval to end the campaign. You've got two good ovals to end the campaign with. Then finally, race number 17 at Laguna Seca. Laguna Seca, I I wanted to put this on my untouchables. I really, really did, but it was so new, I couldn't do it. Um, but it's another vintage track. 
it's one I think needs to stay on the schedule. I mean, that corkscrew, oh my goodness, probably one of the toughest turns in all of road course racing. But that's my schedule. Um, so the honorable mentions, Charlotte, um, the Roval or the Oval, um, I just didn't feel like it'd be good racing. I didn't see it as a realistic possibility. Watkins Glen, I see this being a possibility, but again, um, they just have too many issues negotiating a deal. Uh, Milwaukee, the reason I said no to Milwaukee is they've already got a race at Road America. They have a race in Wisconsin, and if it's going to cost them Road America, I don't think that's a good trade-off. And then, of course, Michigan was the honorable mention, too, because, again, a race in Detroit already. Um, I think, you know, again, just better off keeping it off the schedule. Let's get moving here. We're running a little behind here. Brett Moffat has switched to NASCAR Xfinity points as we now switch gears to NASCAR. Um, of course, I think it's a little too late for Brett Moffat being with a small team. I don't think, unless he gets a win, I don't see him making the playoffs. And I don't see him winning anything over there. Unless, of course, it's like Jeb Burton, who won the NASCAR Xfinity race at Talladega. Um, this one was a shocker, um, but it wasn't, because Colleg has always been so good on super speedways. So, um, not shocking, but I think it's more shocking it's Jeb Burton that won. Uh, Jeb Burton is an incredible driver. Um, he, you know, he's really getting a good chance with a good team. That's the important thing to note here. He's getting his best chance of his career right here. He has bounced around so much. He has had so much bad luck on landing on his feet in NASCAR with sponsorship, with good teams. I'm glad to finally see him get to victory lane. He's not like Michael McDowell by any means, but it's another feel-good story that he won a race. Um, over on the cup side, Brad Keselowski is the winner at Talladega. Um, Matt DiBenedetto made a big mistake, though. He could have won this race. Um, he should not have blocked Ryan Blaney. I can understand why he went up to work with Ryan Blaney, because Ryan Blaney was the best pusher in the field the entire race. Um, but... Again, not a big fan of Brad Keselowski winning, but he's the guy who knows how to get it done. you got to respect his restrictor plate racing abil uh, ability because he's just so darn good. Six wins, he's tied Jeff Gordon and Dale Jr. for second on the Talladega wins list. Um, again, just a storied career of success at Talladega. Uh, Matt DiBenedetto, he said at the end of the race, though, his time will come. He's got to be more aggressive, okay? And not the stupid kind of aggressive that he pulled on Sunday. Of course, he blocked Kyle Busch. He's lucky he didn't get wrecked for doing that because Kyle Busch wrecks people for doing that. But, again, I can understand why you went up blocked Blaney because Blaney's the best pusher. Um, Blaney didn't get help from behind, though, and that's why this didn't work out. Um, you know, I feel for Benedetto. He's the kind of guy I root for to win every single week. I'm a Chase Elliott fan through and through, but I root for people like Matt DiBenedetto. Hell, I rooted for Ross Chastain there at the end. I thought he had a shot, and he went right to the back of the pack. So, um, unfortunate, I guess, to say the least. Um, the other news out of Talladega... A sad story. Uh, of course, Derek Lancaster, if you saw the wreck in the ARCA race, um, he slammed the outside wall on the back stretch. Car went up in flames, and unfortunately, he is currently on a ventilator. I don't have any other further update from Saturday, but he was on a ventilator after the Talladega race. Thoughts and prayers with Derek Lancaster, and hopefully a speedy recovery for him as well of course he was running up front he was having a hell of a race it was a fun race to watch on the arca side as well so to me talladega did not disappoint um so now on to the picks for the weekend let's start with the camping world truck series at kansas 
No brainer. It's Kyle Busch. Excuse me. Uh, Kyle Busch, of course, he's running the truck race this weekend. I believe it's his final one of the season. I, I hate seeing him run these truck races, man, but he's going to win it. I'm sorry. There's just no way. I don't even have to explain why. Okay, he's running against nobodies. He's going to win. Um, Cup Series at Kansas. I think this is where Stuart Haas finally breaks through. I'm picking Kevin Harvick to win this race. I think he's going to get it. Um, I think, you know, Bush is sponsoring it. That doesn't really factor into it, but I think this is where his cold streak comes to an end. And if not, I think Denny Hamlin is another one to watch. Maybe Truex. So now on to the IndyCar picks. Um, to be honest, uh, race one, I'm picking Joseph Newgarden. And then race number two, I'm going to pick uh, Scott Dixon. The past two champions, I believe, they've always been very good at Texas. Um, Scott Dixon was incredible at Texas last year, despite how terrible that track was. So those are my picks for the upcoming weekend in racing. And we want to thank you for watching. Of course, be sure to like or dislike, subscribe, and check out the other shows on this channel. And we'll see you back here next Tuesday with another episode of S or uh, Out of Turn 4. So until then, guys, goodbye, everyone.